Je suis Marie-Diane Clark du département des langues, littérature et études culturelles où j'enseigne le français. I would like to thank you for having invited us, members of the Francophone community of Saskatchewan, to this constructive dialogue between members of the university and members of our communities. In our Francophone community, the questions we sometimes ask ourselves are the following. What can we do and do we do enough to promote our Francophone cultures and the diverse cultures our city brings to our doors and our stage? It goes without saying that for the last few years, a professional Francophone theater company, La Troupe du Jour, has been working towards those goals by promoting cultural diversity and inclusiveness in their productions. Later on, I will invite Denis Rouleau, artistic director of La Troupe du Jour, to explain how the company is working towards those goals. And along with Denis Rouleau, I would like to introduce two other community leaders, Anne-Lise, you know, at the end, uh, and Suzanne Campagne. La Troupe du Jour, the French language theater company based in Saskatoon, received the first ever Arts Vest Outstanding Partnership Award for Francophone Theater in Saskatchewan at the National Business for the Arts Partnership Awards. Denis Rouleau has been the company's artistic director for the past 24 years. He has directed over 30 stage plays, many of them new scripts by Francesquois authors. Interviewé par Joanne Belluco, Denis est décrit comme étant ce Québécois d'origine qui a fait d'une petite troupe communautaire un théâtre qui fait l'envie de plusieurs communautés francophones au pays. Alice is head of the University of Saskatchewan's Department of Community Health and Epidemiology in the College of Medicine. Her areas of expertise are cancer prevention, self-management of chronic diseases, and the impact of culture and language on health. But she wears many other hats as well in our Francophone community. In 2004, Anne a reçu le prix du Volunteer Saskatoon dans la catégorie Diversité culturelle pour son dévouement dans divers organismes francophones de la Saskatchewan. Elle a été vice-présidente ou présidente de la Fédération des francophones de Saskatoon du comité consultatif de l'Institut français de l'Université de Regina, de la Commission nationale des parents francophones, du réseau santé en français de la Saskatchewan, entre autres rôles, multiples rôles. Suzanne Campagne is a professional singer and songwriter who performed nationally and internationally with her brothers and sisters in the groups Fall, Avoine and Art Rouge. De retour en Saskatchewan, elle devient en 2011 la nouvelle directrice générale du Conseil culturel francescois, qui a pour objectif le développement culturel et artistique de la communauté francescoise. Like Denis, Anne and Suzanne show dedication and determination in helping the francescois communauté to meet and overcome its challenges and achieve its goals. Francophones are in a majority in Quebec, but in a minority here in Saskatchewan. Embracing our linguistic duality as well as our uniqueness under the Canadian Constitution, having equal and collective privileges as to the use of our mother tongue by all institutions of the government of Canada, we are nonetheless facing socio-demographic changes that lead to our increasing assimilation in a country where, in another 15 years, over 25% of the population will have been born outside Canada. Inclusiveness, therefore, becomes part of the definition of the Francescois. As Wilfried Denis explained in 2006, a Francescois is a parlant français qui s'identifie à la francophonie en Saskatchewan. In other words, cultural diversity becomes a collective flag. We can therefore ask ourselves what has been accomplished by individuals and organizations in Saskatchewan to help our Francophone community embrace a growing diversity, one that is leading to a reshaping of the mission and objectives of our Francophone institutions? And do we still face unusual barriers to having our voices heard here in Saskatchewan? Are we able to obtain certain promises from our provincial government and institutions 
And are those promises followed up with in initiatives and actions that bring new perspectives to our Francophone population? What has been done, but also what more can be done to reach those goals? These are questions to be addressed during our first discussion. Aujourd'hui, nous couvrirons différents domaines, culturels et artistiques, mais aussi, dans sa présentation, Anne-Lise associera le culturel et la santé. Anne will underscore the importance of language and culture on quality health services. Nous commencerons donc par signaler le changement du visage francophone dans Saskatchewan pour indiquer ensuite ce que ce changement a apporté à nos institutions. Denis et Suzanne, voudriez-vous commencer? Ah, bonjour à tous. Euh, bienvenue. Merci beaucoup de nous accueillir euh, ce matin. Uh, thank you very much for uh, welcoming us here this morning. Um, uh, I'm artistic director of La Troupe du Jour for many years now, and uh, the company, uh, truly those years, had changed, uh, growth, and there was a une grande évolution. Um, Et comme il y a eu une évolution euh, dans la communauté francophone, like their, the, the francophone community uh, changed through the years too. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, uh, 10 years ago, they were uh, at the francophone school or in our audience, it was uh, totally white. <laughs> and now it changed a lot, you know, there's newcomers arrive, uh, uh, a lot of them, lots of family arrive from, you know, different parts of the world and the world and uh, there's new people and uh, uh, so uh, the uh, audience uh, changed too and we, uh, we have to uh, address uh, uh, and to uh, uh, change, we have to change too. <laughs> because there's new people and we have to adapt to, to those people. And so uh, we try at the company to, um, uh, through our programming, to uh, welcome the newcomers, uh, like to program new, new plays. We try different, uh, different initiative uh, in the past year with, uh, like uh, last uh, summer, we did a, a, a show in, uh, during the summer and we, 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 we called him uh, Entre Plaines and Savannah, that means between Plains and Savannah. So we, uh, we, we, we put that show together. It was a, a conte et légende, donc a storytelling. So we chose, you know, uh, storytelling from Africa, you know, from the traditional uh, tradition of Africa, and also from uh, Saskatchewan, like uh, I asked a few playwriter to wrote short little stories, and we uh, put together that uh, wonderful uh, show, and we uh, identified uh, one uh, young actress, uh, originally from Ghana, and she's studying here at the University of Saskatchewan, and uh, one of the Maridian students uh, in fact, and uh, so uh, she came and she uh, uh, performed the show with us, and uh, so that was wonderful, and we performed that show in different uh, uh, communities ac across the province, in, uh, in gardens, in private gardens, so that was really interesting, and it brought, and, and uh, we uh, reached uh, different families of uh, new coming family uh, from Africa and they invited us in their garden with that show and it it was amazing it was fantastic the uh, the the uh, collaboration and the uh, the exchange uh, through the, the the performance but also after because people invited it in their garden, in their houses. So we had coffee, we had tea, we had, you know, a little barbecue and we talked and, 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 and create, you know, uh, uh, relationships uh, with those uh, uh, wonderful people. Uh, also, we tried at La Compagnie uh, to be inclusive uh, to everybody, to the ears, you know. We, we, we did few experiences um, a few years ago, we used to do the, the show. <laughs> that was a little bit crazy, but the, for the actors, <laughs> we d used to do the show in French, but also in English. So we asked the, the actors 
to uh, learn their parts in French, but also learned it in English too. So we used to perform, you know, like we said, you know, two days in English, two days in French, two days in English, two days in French. So it was a little bit chaotic, but uh, 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 sometimes the actors was talking in the, night, the French night talking and whoops, a, a line in English will split out, you know, and vice versa. But it was a little bit challenging for them. It was double the job, you know, for, for those actors for, for the same salary, of course. And, uh, but, uh, so we, we, did, we did that for a few years. And after that, we heard our, um, about our friend in the Théâtre Français de Toronto, so the French theater in Toronto, they were trying to, a new thing, surtitle. So me and Danny Rousseau, uh, the administrative, administrative director of the, at the company, we went down to Toronto to visit with those people, we knew those people, and to see a show with the surtitle, because we didn't have a clue what was that. But they said, you know, it's interesting, that's a way to bring uh, people who uh, uh, don't speak French, don't understand French, to come to see our show, or people who, you know, they said, you know, oh yeah, I did French immersion when I was in the school, but that's 10 years ago, I don't remember. Uh, you know, so they said they, they feel more more welcoming, more uh, uh, willing to come to see. So we went there, we sat with them, they explained us how that worked, and we said, okay, on the plane back, me and Danny, we said, okay, let's try it, okay? <laughs> so we tried it for, for one show uh, seven years ago, and of course, it was, it's a PowerPoint, you know, you take the script in English, you put it in a PowerPoint, and you have a technician who push enter 600 times, you know, <laughs> because you have to follow the actors. And sometimes, of course, at the beginning, it was not perfect, you know, that time, you know, it was a, a little cushy cushy. But through the years, we find people who uh, are uh, really good at that, and uh, it's the uh, profession now, because we ca you can do a master in surtitle at the University of Alberta. So the person who's, who's doing it with, with us did, did that, you know, and she's really good, and she's not just a technician, but sh she also edits the text. So she's there at the rehearsal, and she tries, sometimes she cut a line to go to the essential, and so through the years, it's coming more uh, efficient uh, for people. And sometimes, some evenings, at the theater, half of the audience are not French speaking because of that. So we developed a new audience and that's also make us able to have more visibility through the arts community. Uh, now we got reviews in the Star Phoenix before we didn't because they said we can review something we don't understand. So now they come and our peers come to see our show too now because be before they didn't come, you know, it was hard for us to, we were really, really isolated in our little, you know, the French little theater there and the rest of the theater uh, community was there. But now there's more link our artists work with other theater, like David Granger is, you know, is designing for every theater in town, and uh, Gilles Zolti is composing music for every theater in town, and even in the Globe now in Regina, you know, because people came to see the show, they saw the, the, the work of those artists, and now they want to have them uh, in their uh, theater too, you know. Um, Carol Gray, I talked about her program with passion. Uh, uh, it's, it's really wonderful, Carol, and you do a good job. I love you. Um, <laughs> we, we spent the last two days together doing a reading in French in Regina uh, with the uh, Spring Festival. So uh, it was wonderful. And uh, yeah, this is something we tried to do too. Uh, not just us, La Troupe du Jour, to have a French uh, uh, theater program, it's impossible, you know, but what we tried in the past with the other uh, um, Western province, with the other theater company in the West, and we tried, and we tried, we worked on that for 10 years, and it was close to that, but it didn't pass through, you know, so we still have to send our kids to Montreal or Quebec or University of Ottawa to learn their, their skills for theater, to, to become professional theater artists, but sometimes they don't come back. 
because when you pass three or four years with a group of people studying theater, after three or four years, you met new friends, your teacher are practicing working in theater company, and sometimes you start your career there, and they're not coming back. But we try to bring them back, you know, for shows, you know, for projects, but that means uh, for us, production costs double because we have to you know, bring people back, uh, it's airplane, it's fares, it's all accommodation, it's per diem, et cetera, so, so it's, uh, and we have to do that. So uh, it's, uh, for us, it's uh, a little bit challenging at, at the company too. Uh, I think I'll stop there for now. <laughs> Uh, okay, hi everyone. My uh, my name is Suzanne Campagne, and uh, I uh, was a I, I did a a singing career, a singer songwriter career for twenty years, uh, living in Quebec. Uh, because uh, when I started to sing, when my family started to sing, I come from a very uh, very musical family. We didn't have any choice if we wanted to do our métier. En français, we, we, we had to move to Quebec. It was the only way. Um, and one of the first uh, things that happened when we got to Quebec is having been told by a father who is very, our father was, was very much an activist in the French community in Willowbunch, Saskatchewan. Uh, he kept telling us as we were teenagers, you know, those awful years that, you know, keep speaking French, keep doing it because, you know, you're going to be ending up maybe in some parts of the world where you're going to be able to speak French with, any, with, with everybody. And so one of the first things that happened when we got to Quebec is we would start to speak French to the Quebecois and they would respond to us in English because we had that little accent, you know, we had a different accent. And so it was a bit of a, it was a, a moment, an awareness moment that um, we, uh, we, we well, that I have a very distinct way of speaking, of thinking, that you will not find in uh, anywhere, probably anywhere else in the world. And it made me, on one hand, feel more isolated, but at the same time, a sort of a pride that, uh, you know, I, there is a distinctness about me that uh, I wanted to preserve. So... 40, uh, for, thir for 20 years, I, I did that career, and then I came back. Um, I came back to Saskatchewan because I wanted to uh, give to this community like they had given to me in the, at, at, right at the beginning. Uh, and so I came back, uh, as, and now I am the director of the Conseil Culturel Francescois, the Francescois Cultural Council that uh, is um, an organization that handles both artistic and, and cultural development in the 14 official uh, Francescois communities in Saskatchewan, but also a service to the artists uh, of all disciplines. So we have sort of a double mandate. And, uh, and the first thing I, I, I can say is that uh, there are... There's a lot of success stories uh, with regards to the French language in Saskatchewan. I, I don't think that there has there has many people speaking uh, French in Saskatchewan. Uh, there has never been as many people because uh, one of the great successes, the institutional uh, successes, is the French immersion programs. The French immersion programs uh, are the only uh, programs in the education that are thriving, that are that are increasing, that are expanding, and that is because we really did adopt on one level uh, the diversity. We we ad we adopted the uh, the notion that diversity was important on that on that level. Um, so I can say that there are have never been as many French speaking people. Uh, Forty years ago, you almost had to be careful where you spoke French in Saskatchewan, uh, and that's not there anymore. I, or very, I, I, I frequent very little of it. 
uh, you know, 40 years ago when you were didn't like the service in the restaurant, you could complain in French. You can't do that anymore because most of them speak, you know, most of them have been through immersion programs and so you've, you've got to watch what you say, you know, <laughs> which is okay. Um, but uh, I, so I think that French as a second language has, has uh, those programs have really been successful. But now, you know, for French community, French speaking communities, Francesco communities, first language, I, I think that we can say that it's a bit of a different story. I think there's a lot more challenges there. And, uh, you know, one of the challenges is that our, you know, most of the Francesco communities had been very uh, rural. Uh, we have people, you know, communities like Zenon Park and Gravitbourg and Pontex uh, were, were, were sort of like cornerstones of the Franco the Francescoisie. And now those communities are dwindling. The, 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 there's an aging population. Uh, most of our young people are finding themselves in either Regina or Saskatoon or moving away. So, uh, you know, the texture, the, the, the fabric of the communities has changed a lot in the last, I would say, in the last uh, 30 years. Now, uh, what we do uh, at the Conseil Culturel Francescois is we are very involved in, in education, in providing resources for not only the Francescois uh, cult, uh, Commission Scolaire um, School Board, the Francescois School Board, but also the immersion programs. And, and one of the things that we're really doing is really trying to open up to new uh, partners, uh, partnerships with our Anglophone uh, cultural counterparts. Uh, we created, for instance, the other uh, last year, we created a, a project with New Dance Horizon in Regina, and we had this wonderful group. Uh, some of you have already heard this story, but we had this wonderful group called Le Patin Libre. They were they were professional figure skaters who had put together this show, um, and their idea was to educate kids that figure skating, artistic figure skating was a lot more than, you know, pasted on smiles and sequent uh, dresses, you know. So it was a really great education. There was a lot of educational value. And they were, they, they did their whole show in French. So we had like 1,600 kids uh, from the immersion schools and from the French schools who were uh, at the government, you know, at the skating rink. And uh, it was a really wild moment. And this little girl came up to me at the end because she saw that I was one of the organizers and she says, Madame, she says this to me in French, Madame, I've never seen anyone skate in French so well, <laughs> you know? So it, it was a real moment for me because I realized that, that, you know, for this little girl, I mean, this whole world had been created, this whole world of, of, of skill and beauty had been opened up for her, whereas probably in the past, it had only been words that she was learning. So I think that this is the sort of thing that we bring into the community, is, is trying to put like real live models, uh, Francesquois artists, uh, Quebecois and uh, Acadian artists in front of the, the, those kids to get them to see that French is much more than just a language. It, it's, it's, a, it's a world, it's a culture. And I think that, um, you know, one of the challenges that we have in Saskatchewan is that, uh, you know, multiculturalism is very, is, 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 it's very, uh, you know, it's, it's very popular, it's very important, and it is important because I think that they bring in notions of diversity and, and being open and, uh, and tolerance and uh, honoring differences. I think that all of those, those uh, th those aspects are important, and 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 with being part of a French uh, minority group, bilingualism is less is less interesting in Saskatchewan. It's it's less a notion that is vendeur in in uh, Saskatchewan. So that's some of the challenges that we have because um, there's a lot of funding out there. There's a lot of programs for. Uh, you know, the, the, the Francescois organizations and stuff. But I think that sometimes we, we, we miss the mark. Uh, our, our funding models sometimes miss the mark in that um, we're very much about um, 
about you know uh, the administrative side of things, the reporting. The uh, many of our organizations uh, that are smaller organizations spend eighty percent of their time uh, looking for money, funding, uh, writing reports, uh, and it's a very you know for a for a population that is two percent of you know five percent of of, of the, the nation. Sometimes, you know, um, the, these, uh, you know, the, it's very exhausting for those, for, for those volunteers, for those people, for those people who work in those organizations. And that's one of the challenges that we have to deal with is the uh, funding process. And I think that, you know, I think that that has to change. And I think that it is changing a little bit. Um, I was, uh, speaking with one of the uh, cultural agencies in Saskatchewan uh, and the first thing he said to me because he was about um, cultural industries and and uh, commercial viability and the f and the f one of the first things he said to me he says look I just want to make it clear that cultural significance has very little importance for me you know um, it's 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 more the cult you know the commercial viability that's important for me and so you know we kept on talking and well I first told him I said well I try not to sacrifice one for the other but you know whatever uh, but then and then the, con the the conversation continued and I said you know it's really too bad about you know the whole that that, that whole take you have on on commercial viability because I said you know for instance in Europe I said First Nation uh, art First Nation uh, artifacts I mean it's huge you know it's huge he says I know why do you think I, I I put them in showcases why do you think I'm 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 pushing that and I said well why do you think that uh, it's important why do you think that it that it uh, it's it works and he said well because there's a demand for it and I said but why do you think that there's a demand for it and then he, I said wait for it wait for it cultural significance <laughs> Sort of the things that we deal that that we have to deal with as a, as a two percent of uh, of a five percent uh, of a, you know a province that it, that is small, and um, yeah, two percent uh, is uh, and depending sometimes it's two percent depending on the statistics or the research that's done. So it could be up to three per three point four percent, but ultimately. Uh, you know, within the Saskatchewan context, at times uh, it's challenging. And one of my goals was to come back here and, and say that if artists wanted to pursue a career en français or bilingual, that they wouldn't have to move to Quebec, that they could stay home. And that's my goal, and that's, um, that's what I'm about, you know. Thank you. And, uh, sorry. I would like to underscore that this year we ha we have uh, a francophone tent, you know, in the for the, the children festival, yes. right, Susan? Yes. 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 Okay. So so now we are going to hear uh, Annelise, uh, and uh, after Annelise presents her PowerPoint and you know discuss about uh, the uh, relation relation between uh, health services and languages. We will have a discussion, a few questions. Okay, merci. Uh, <clears throat> so good, uh, good morning. Uh, almost at lunch, I'm just kind of the person, you know, that is actually preventing you from, from having lunch. So I apologize. I'll try to be uh, as brief as possible. I did a PowerPoint and, you know, I may skip a few slides because of what we heard already. Uh, we didn't rehearse everything perfectly before we, we came here, so. Um, okay, so the, I just uh, was, I'm going to take a bit of a shift from what we have heard and talk about what the, the a bit the association between culture, language, and health. Uh, I'm in the health sector. We know, and this is kind of a diagram that comes uh, from Dal Green and Whitehead in 2003, and it kind of shows as if you look at the outer circle that, you know, we have actually society, societal, general socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental factors that influence our health. Obviously, we are, our and cultural identity is there, although it's not shown. Another graphic that comes here from the um, 
the uh, World Health Organization. Uh, I wanted to just show the, the social, economic, and political context that will influence who we are as individuals and our well-being. And what you see here, you have governance. So we are talking about governance at all level. So yes, the cultural co gov uh, governance, and, but also other governance of the, in our society. And we heard from our indigenous friends that we want to be part of those governance to make decisions. The macroeconomic uh, policy and cultural and societal value. It's amazing how we actually don't realize that we are part of societies that have a lot of values and culture, and we think this is the norm. This, it's everywhere like this, and it's not. People start to travel, or people go up north, they realize quickly that what they know in Saskatoon is not the same elsewhere. So, and all these will have an influence, and I'm skipping over many things, but I just wanted to give this as a, a little context. Um, okay, so, here we see culture, and the culture is, has some visible aspects, and some visible aspects are the artifacts and how we dress and you know, uh, how we kind of talk and you know, some of the, kind of you know, the customs, the language, etc. But there are some deeper things, like, such as you know, beliefs, health beliefs, values, a sense of time, uh, communication styles, you know, the notion of modesty, many, many things that kind of shape us, how stories, how we actually we grew up, you know, and here, just uh, I was just sharing with uh, Michelle before. You know, I was I went to a dance um, last Saturday, and it was the 60th anniversary. So guess what kind of dance music we kind of played? It was actually, you know, a, a music from the 80s or 70s and 80s. So which which is kind of you know close to my time. So this was not the problem, but it was kind of music, uh, North American music, and so on. I grew up in Europe. I had no connection to this music. You know, like I was, I could, you know, dance with the beat and so on, but people were singing, they were moving, you know, they, they were all kind of singing, and I was kind of, it was not part of me. So we have to realize that part of our identity is shaped by where we come from, shaped by the stories we heard, shaped by the, you know, the songs, that, or the lullabies that we heard. You know, actually, another thing is when I actually was growing, um, raising my kids here, and I went to nursery school, I didn't know all the songs, so I taught, I sang my own lullabies to my kids. Anyway, so the visible, invisible aspects, also, it, it's an integral part of identity. People from different backgrounds and cultures have different ways of identifying and making sense of an issue, different preferred support pathways or mechanisms to deal with them. Uh, culture and ethnicity influence how people understand health and illness, perceive and evaluate their own health, make life cho lifestyle choices, participate in prevention, health promotions, etc. Uh, what is important is that service or intervention, health care, health promotion, that does not understand these differences, and I think it applies to other sectors as well, may create patterns of support that do not fit or do not accommodate target populations at best, or further marginalize the most vulnerable among us at worst. And I think that's kind of what we have to kind of realize, even in the culture domain, in the health domain, and any other services we, we give uh, uh, to provide. So dominant healthcare values, and so here I'm talking the healthcare system, may contribute to marginalization and devaluation of our own language and culture. And that's why I'm actually engaged in this uh, area. Uh, so we heard, you heard the 2% of the Saskatchewan population. This is francophones all over. We are about 1 million outside Quebec. Uh, now, obviously, with francophile, people who have learned French, we are way more. The francophone situation, one language, well, one language, many regional accents, you know, and so maybe it's several languages because people speak, you know, we heard that the example speak French differently de depending on where they grew up and where they come from. Diverse cultures, many, many cultures. So when we talk about minority, and I saw this in my own kids, the psychological adjustment uh, or ch uh, challenges uh, among youth who may be ashamed to be part of a minority. When actually our kids go to uh, the French school, 
the, the, the first French Ecole Canadienne Française here in Saskatoon or others, at some point, they don't want to be part of this minority. They want to be just like, and it's so, so they want to be part of the majority. They don't want to be isolated. And it's not only for Francophones, others, other groups are experiencing that. Uh, the, this person isolation within provinces and territories. Uh, you know, we have also women who are, who are caught between their elderly parents and raising children, and there are some cultural issues as well here. There are new Francophone immigrants who have, who have to face additional hurdles in trying to fit in the minority context. They are actually triple minority, you know, as far as I'm concerned. They come from somewhere else in Canada, and they think they can speak French, and they, they, they feel actually isolated. Uh, okay, so just quickly, so the, the language and culture barriers have been shown to discourage people from, uh, from using healthcare services for reason of prevention. There is uh, an issue with access to care or access to services. Um, the, there is a lower satisfaction of services, of, um, of uh, services received. And I, I can just give you another example this morning. I was actually asked to be part of a, a little of a meeting with uh, nurses and a physician, and a couple who is from Quebec. Who, you know, the the man had uh, an issue, a health issue, an, uh, you know, in his brain, and and her part, his partner was uh, not really fluent in English. And she, I was called. She said. I don't know, I have not understood a thing of what they are doing. I don't know why, why he gets the shot. I don't know why, what is this issue. I don't know what is the prospect. Anyway, she was extremely frustrated. So we convened a meeting to, to discuss uh, you know, the issue. She had a chance to ask questions. This is, this is, this is exactly what it is. Yeah. And it's language, but also culture, because of, you know, we, as you, we know, uh, some people, some Specific groups uh, have different ways of uh, dealing with health. So we are not talking about having parallel system and so on, but I think this graph is just to show that the more the, the, the services are psychological and relational, the more it is important to speak the own language of the patient, you know, whether it's you know, French you know, here or elsewhere. You know, if it's actually technical, you know, if you get a surgery, the first thing you, you, what you care about is having a great surgeon. You don't care if he speaks French or she speaks French. But when, you, when it's kind of uh, accompanying people from maternal services, mental health, you know, palliative care, very important. So the solution, and then I'm almost done, networking is a cornerstone. And this is actually a model of the, uh, again, the World Health Organization here. We have done for years, we have looked at, this is in French. This is my test for you. <laughs> this is decision makers, political decision makers, training institutions like universities, the healthcare organization, hospitals, communities, and professionals. Often the decisions were made like this, right? And the communities was, was outside the picture. The individual was outside the picture. In order to be successful and to have thriving communities and thriving individuals who feel that they are cared for and can be and, and just um, are well, we need to include those communities because people know what their needs are. So here, the governance model, vers l'unité pour la santé, towards duty for health. This is what it is, and this is what uh, the, the, um, in, the organization at the national level is called Société Santé en Français. It's a network of networks in each province and territories to actually for this movement. So what are some of the directions here that we have? We have uh, obviously the community development, uh, empowerment, and community governance, very important in order to uh, uh, have uh, community vitality and sustainability. We need research to generate knowledge, share and mobilize community. Uh, we can influence policy through concerted actions and, and also uh, work on the leadership of the community and leadership of our youth. We need to actually build uh, th this leadership. And then, th so this is uh, the, the health goals from La Société Santé en Français. I just want to kind of attract, this is again in French, but this is actually, we want to have 
healthy communities who contribute to uh, society and healthy individuals with, the, with those, and access to services in their own language. So the call for action, I heard someone who said we need for call for actions. They may not be the great goals, but I wanted to say an active offer of services is key, certainly for, for health. Uh, we are inter it's in important to uh, be creative to reorganize services. Um, so for example, a long-term care facility doesn't have to be all French, but what about just regrouping the people who speak French, or maybe speaking something else, in one wing of this healthcare facility and assign a healthcare professionals who can speak their language? Well, we would go a long way. This would make a whole difference for, for example, aging people who are losing their command of English. Often is the case. They may speak Ukrainian, they can may speak German, they may speak French. Uh, also, a targeted training to improve communication between healthcare professionals and francophone patients. Uh, one key, whoops, I, I almost did it. Uh, this is important, Le legitimize services in a mandatory official language through legislative me measures. Here in Saskatchewan, we only, have, we only have a policy for francophone services. It's just a policy. In other uh, provinces, we have a bill, like, you know, obviously New Brunswick is, is bilingual. In, um, in uh, Ontario, there is actually legislation that actually asks for, um, to um, force people to give services. And sometimes dispel myths, you know. When I arrived in Saskatchewan in 1990, people thought that only the people who were well off were speaking French. So I think we have to come. This was one of those myths. Thank you very much. So we open the floor now to questions and comments. Présentation. Je, je voudrais parler pour un instant du portail culturel francescois. <laughs> I was going to. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, just very briefly, Sorry. when I was at the Saskatchewan Arts Board, there was an opportunity, an opportunity, a door cracked open for a partnership with <clears throat> the province and the federal government, Canadian Heritage. And just as the Arts Board at the time was withdrawing from supporting projects, it was able to consolidate some funding to be matched by Canadian Heritage to support a program called the Portail Culturel Francescois. And when we finished that, and uh, Carol Gray Eyes worked on it, and Risa Payot worked on it. Risa, I think you were with me at the uh, final evaluation. It was overwhelmingly positive. Everybody wanted this to continue. But it didn't. So why was that? And it actually connects, Suzanne, to what you were talking about in turn, and, and from the previous presentation, I think Carol uh, uh, talked about institutional layers and forms and, and administrative, uh, maybe this relates to a, a cult of accountability, which serves as a barrier to activity being able to take place because yep. of the, 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 yep. the time that, that it takes. And, and I, I, I'll invite your comments, but, but I, in, in large measure it failed. We had a solid proposal to move ahead and everyone thought it was a solid proposal, but Canadian Heritage would not bend on the rules that they were governed by. And as a result, we weren't able to make that work. And that's the only reason, because the Arts Board was certainly committed to continuing dedicated support to the Francesco community in the province at the time. So I just did, I, from a, you know, the conference theme in relation to, to cultural policy, when there are partnerships that cross jurisdictions of this sort, there needs to be some form of amelioration to be able to accommodate what it takes in order to make things happen, when everyone agrees that there's value in, in the proposition. So I invite your comments, thank you. Well, uh, Peter, thank you for that comment because that Portail Francesco was such a huge success for our community. I mean, artists and uh, organizations that have been uh, 
that had been asking, uh, had, had, had grant proposals for years and always been declined, were, were you know, 84%, I think, of the people who were asking in that program got and received, and it was a, a huge benefit for our, our community, and we tried and tried to make it happen again, and it just, it just, you know, it just couldn't happen. It just wouldn't. The, and uh, and one of the reasons I think is because, you know, we're so. It's it's part of what I was saying about sometimes our our funding models. There are projects that are just not necessarily. Um, they're just not necessarily good for a minority context population. And this, this uh, is one of them. Like you say, Heritage Canada would bend the rules because they have this rule that if you, if you do one project one year, it has to be different the next year. You have to get, so this is a very, it's a very difficult thing for, uh, for, for, a, for the, uh, our community because how can you measure success if, Every year it has to be regenerated. You can't, you can't repeat the same thing. When, whereas often, in order to see results, and in order to have results, you have to do something like two, three, four years in a row. And it's not about not being creative and not being innovative. It's about putting structures in place that will benefit you know, the specific needs of a community. And, and I thank you for mentioning that because, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of opportunities that our artists and that our organizations don't have in matching funds from the federal government because much of the time the Saskatchewan, uh, the, the interprovincial governments that they have in organizations uh, don't agree or don't set up partnerships that will really help project developments and exchanges in different, uh, in different uh, provinces. We have an educational entente uh, amongst other provinces, but we don't have a cultural uh, entente, and that is a huge loss for many of the organizations and many of our artists. So thank you for bringing it up. Denise, do you have? Yeah, it was, uh, uh, it was amazing, okay? It was crazy, okay, because the art world, I remember, Peter, we had a meeting at La Troupe du Jour, and he said, okay, this is a program, that's the deadline, and it's for two years, and he said, okay, okay, us, La Troupe du Jour, me and Danny, we said, okay, we can do that, we have, okay, things we want to do for years, now we can, they're here, let's put them on paper, but we look at Peter, we say, what about the artists? They don't know, they don't know how to apply. They never do because they know they will be refused. So we said, we have to organize a meeting, public meeting for the artists. So we pick up the phone and we phone everybody we know and say, okay, tomorrow at six o'clock meeting at La Troupe du Jour, Peter will be there to explain the program. And we start the machine. And so those artists started to phone us, me and Danny. So I want to do a project, but I never apply at the arts board. I don't know what to do, you know? So we, we tried, we started a consultant for application, you know? So the artists were coming in different field, you know, visual art, artist, musician, everywhere, and say, okay, this is my ID. Okay, so I was developing the ID with them, and after that, they went to see Danny to, to put the budget together, because they didn't know how to put the budget, you know? They didn't know, say, for touring, oh, I can have, put money to accommodation, I don't have to uh, uh, stay in, a, in, a, in my friend's uh, living room uh, so far. Oh, I can have a per diem on tour. Oh, okay, <laughs> great, I didn't know. So it was, they discovered a word how to apply to the arts board and they were successful and those project was amazing. And shame of that thing, it's not, continue because it was not just project it was training too and it it was really 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 a big push and boom now i just want to say uh, you know put a context on things i am a member of uh, many national organizations as uh, saskatchewan you know francis and and in saskatchewan i i mean i am the envy of many other provinces so it's not like it's not like uh, it's uh, it's tough living in Saskatchewan as a as a as a Francesquois. That is not it's not the case. So we're the envy of many 
uh, other organizations that rarely get or very get very little from their province. You know, you're looking at the maritime provinces. It's it's a, it's quite unbelievable. So you know, I don't want to I don't want to yeah. be anybody to be left with oh it's 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 hell being Francisco in Saskatchewan. It's uh, it's not. And there's that was a great initiative, and it's too bad it didn't uh, continue. But you know, there'll be others. Going to ask a question, make a comment, but maybe we should cut and go for, to lunch. What do you say? But otherwise, I, I'll just make my comment very briefly. I was going to do it in French. Je vais le faire en français puis je vais le répéter en anglais. Je pense que vous êtes très humble et très honnête sur la situation. You're very humble and very honest about the situation of the francophone community. And I think this is a good case of protecting and promoting. How do you promote by, and how do you protect by promoting? And how do you open and while, you know, ensuring continuity? Je pense que ça, c'est un très bon exemple de ce, ce dilemme-là. I've heard things that I, I think I want to echo and, and positive, positively reinforce the emotional connection. Culture should not be a punishment, should not be something that is imposed, should be something that is emotionally connecting, rewarding, and meaningful to one's life. So think of organizing events, skating was, was the good example. <laughs> no, but truly, we, we, because speaking the French language is like you're punished to be in that community forever, you know, it's what? Co-creation, I thought it was pretty clever too, the engagement and, and the connection between communities and beyond borders, I thought it was pretty, pretty good. Uh, sustainable de development culture for all in other sort of venues, as sort of cultural halls, in, in health, in, in the workplace, in schools. And um, my, my question actually is, are, is are francophone communities realizing that they're part of diversity? Is it not a, a stronger position to take now than just to say we're a national sort of founding nation and one of the two official languages when actually the big discussion right now, even at the national level, is about diversity? So are you repositioning yourself, it seems so, to connect with the other minority groups or diversity groups, let's not call minority groups, and saying we're one of many voices and should be considered so. Can I just say, uh, I, um, I'll just be very quick. Um, yeah, we are opening up. and We are opening up a lot. Um, you know, the Francesco community used to be very insular and very uh, ghettoized, and uh, uh, we have to do things that are only in French because we will lose our language. And, and I think that that's a shift that has really happened uh, for in our community. Um, and, you know, Right now, there's a, there's a French school board. We only have one French school board, and it is, it is quite contentious at this point in our community. We're having problems. Um, we're having problems uh, just uh, coming to terms with a lot of changes that are happening. And, and I was thinking the other day that if I was to meet uh, Premier Wall, I would say to him, you know, I would say to him, it's why don't we look at it instead of thinking what do they want as opposed to what they deserve? Because again, this 2% thing. I, I, I would invite you to look at, in 50 years, what are history books gonna be saying about who you were being and that your government was being with the minority, the French-speaking minorities, and when other minorities as well? Because I think that's the, that the real issue. You know, uh, in 50 years, who, what, what's going to be said? Because sometimes history sort of weirds it, its ugly head, and, and you know, with the whole truth and reconciliation process, we know that some of those answers, some of those questions, had, don't have very pretty answers. And I would, I would say to him, you know, what are we going to be saying about that in 50 years? And I have to, as a leader in the Francesco community, say to my organizations, who are we? You know what? Are, what are the history books going to say about us in in fifty years? What what you know? What did we do to get rid of our you know sacred cows? And what did we do to include the, the new arrivals? You know the Frank, the African French uh, communities. Who are we being? Who were we being in that in two thousand sixteen? And I think if we sort of shift those questions, that we'll probably get a lot further. Last comment from uh, Anne. No, I, I, I could not answer the question about funding and so on, but what I, I wanted to just kind of um, end with a little story. 
I was actually the president of the, Frank of the Francophone Association here in town um, for about six years uh, in the early 2000s. And um, I remember Heritage Canada, you know, at that time, the, the, the vision was actually to build community schools. So it's cool with community uh, spaces for the... And Denis was there and said, no way. We are going to have a theater and it's going to be inter... You know, like, in a, it will be professional and have relationship with all the other theater companies. So we can... We don't want to be isolated in this. And, and the other... The community said, we don't want to have a community center in a school because people are not going to come and they because so so there is more so heritage canada said well sorry we are only going to fund one project so you choose and i said so i said okay what you want to you want to fund a school with spaces in it community spaces okay we'll take that but I guarantee you that we will have our theater uh, space and we're going to have a francophone space because the community is going to do whatever it takes to get it and fundraise. And that's what happens. We have it now today, 10 years later. 